So welcome to the second day of the 21st Gulasch Programmiernacht to the talk Unlimited Free Accounts, your own mail server in 60 minutes. We all use emails every day and now we are going to see a talk about how to set up our own email server. The speaker is Benjamin who uh, graduated here in Karlsruhe at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology and is now working as a um, consulting <laughs> Person and yes, yes. that's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for the introduction. To be fair, I didn't give him much more than that. <laughs> I, I didn't think it was relevant. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, I already uh, told you that it will be a, quite a packed talk with a lot of information. Um, ideally, there is a live coding session um, about, of about 50 minutes, but um, given the network um, uh, issues, maybe I will just talk about it. Um, I will upload the code to do it yourself um, to, the, to the net. You can download it tomorrow from my blog or somewhere or GitHub. Um, so you can do it yourself. It's uh, actually uh, quite easy. You just have to um, repeat the steps here and um, I will give you the explanation for why you have to do it. Um, yeah, uh, but uh, briefly, uh, who am I? I'm, I'm Benjamin, as uh, my Herald already said. I'm an IT consultant, uh, currently working for TNG Technology Consulting. Um, uh, I should mention that because they are uh, nice enough to pay for me being here as a uh, Ford Bildung, um, which I find great. So I wear the t-shirt and I use their PowerPoint presentation slides. <laughs> um, no, they're awesome. Also in my uh, free time, I do a lot of blogging and I organize meetups. So um, if you ever have uh, uh, the need to um, get uh, uh, the nicest and greatest stuff from the cloud or uh, from AI, then come to our meetup, it's uh, AI, cloud, AI, AI Cloud Innovation in Karlsruhe. Yeah, so why do we do this? Actually, I don't know why you would do it, um, but I know that you have to be a bit weird to want to do it because, uh, or uh, yeah, I mean, it's a mail server and there's so much stuff you have to do for it. And um, yeah, that, you have, really have to be a, a bit kind of weird to actually want to deal with that in your free time. I mean, or, yeah, but um, for me, it started out when um, after, I mean, I started out with free email accounts like everybody else, like AOL, Gmail and stuff like that. So back in the day. Uh, and then, um, yeah, I started reading the news and that, that wasn't too healthy. Um, I mean, you read stuff like, yeah, Gmail is uh, reading your emails, they're scanning it for advertisements, they're, um, uh, there are actually persons who read your emails, they're selling the information and stuff like that. And uh, at some point I, I, I didn't want to uh, have my uh, emails on Gmail or somewhere else. I mean, most email providers do this. There are some who don't or presumably don't, um, but they are of course not free. And by then I was already down the path of doing it myself. And I think it's fun, yeah, so. Um, but my main reason was privacy. And uh, of course, um, cost, I mean, yeah, you can have free email accounts, but by now you have uh, most of the time um, some kind of cost associated with it. Either it's your privacy uh, or um, it's reading ads that by now are injected into your mails in some providers, I mean that's that's really fucked up. And um, if you then want something that's not uh, that's not with ads, then you have to at least pay 50, 60, 70 euros per year, and then this comes without all the premium features that you have to pay extra for. Yeah, I don't want to do that either. Okay, but if you decide to do it yourself, you will encounter um, one problem, and this is that you have to realize that you have not only one problem, but you have many problems. And this is just because, um, thanks. Uh, this is sorry. Um, this is because a mail server, that's not one thing. Um, a mail server is comprised of a lot of moving parts that interact together and they influence each other. And you have, uh, in the beginning, you basically have no idea where to start and what to choose. And, um, Everything is configured differently 
every part of that has its different way of doing it and even then when you um, arrive at okay I, I have to use these and these parts then you have for every part you have 10 or 20 alternatives that you can use you know, for, for your uh, email storage you can uh, use a file system you can use an IMAP server that are two completely different ways of doing it and then if you decide okay I need an IMAP server because I uh, want to use it with Thunderbird okay which IMAP server do I use there are 10 and like 8 are not maintained and 2 are maintained and uh, whatever um, that's so much stuff that you have to do before you get it done <laughs> yeah so this um for me that was a, a big hurdle and uh, i mean i i um did that originally during my studies so i really had time to do it if you if you start without any guidance then oh jesus and um of course most of the documentation that you can read online is either outdated uh, or doesn't apply to you because you want to do something else so what do we want to do today uh, i want to give you um one example of how to do it so, uh, to just maybe lessen the anxiety of doing it a bit and give you um, a starting point from where you can then migrate into what you want to do um, or to adapt this solution to your needs um, ideally i wanted to do it online but um, apparently <laughs> no net so uh, i'm very very sorry for that um, i will just show you what to do yeah but that um, actually that was not the problem before uh, because I already got an IP address before okay I will retry oh okay I got I got net so now let's try something else if that also works Yes, okay, great. All right, so we can do it online. That is a big load of my chest. Thanks for whoever was that who fixed it. Um, okay, so uh, we're gonna leave off. Yep, okay. So um, this will be quite a process. And um, so it, it will be a bit complicated and I can't, uh, I can't go in a, um, a lot of detail on every step. So if you have questions, just ask them right away. Because um, again, the, the, ideally this talk takes me 59 minutes and after that um, there is only a limited uh, amount of time to ask questions. So ask questions immediately uh, when you have them because um, the more questions you ask, the more um, understanding you build, the closer you are to actually getting a mail server running. If I just uh, read it out to you and you don't get anything of it, uh, then there, uh, you just wasted an hour. Okay, by the way, why would you not do that? <laughs> First of all, of course, is reliability. You will um, set up a mail server, maybe for the first time, but also if you do it for the tenth time, um, that in big organizations that sell that service, um, every part of it will have at least one person who gets paid to service that part all out, all the time. You will do it in your free time with the limited understanding that you have, or maybe you are an expert, then um, that doesn't apply to you, but it certainly applies to me. And because I only have limited understanding of this. Yeah? Okay, if you ask me some in-depth question about, hey, why should I use that kind of service uh, in that setting uh, on Postfix, I will go like, uh, read the manual, I don't know. Um, uh, and then there, there, there will things that uh, there will be things that just happen. Like you have to reboot your server because there is a, um, a downtime uh, on your provider because he has to um, do some updates, or you do ha have to do some updates, or there is a certificate issue and stuff like that. So there, there will be um, out, uh, out time, and um, you will not save time by doing this. So I mean, if you're an expert, maybe, but I would suggest you you don't save time with it so uh, only do it if you if you really want to do it and if you see um, a lot of benefits for you that outweigh not paying for that service and doing it yourself because of like privacy reasons okay um yeah and there is 
one thing I have to mention. <laughs> when you um, start your own mail server, you have to put that thing on the internet. And as we all know, the internet is not the most friendly of places. So everyone and their mother will be after you. You will receive so much spam, you will receive mails from scammers, you will uh, potentially be hacked. Although the, um, the uh, chance for that is fairly low if you're only doing it for your uh, own purposes and if you're not uh, running a Microsoft product. By the way, don't run a Microsoft product. I mean, not unless you're paid for it really well. Um, it's just not worth your lifetime. Um, the, the last time a, a friend of mine <laughs> put an uh, exchange server on the internet, it took exactly five minutes until it was taken over by someone. <laughs> and he was out of the, the house by then, so the, this thing did distribute spam for hours until he could get back and shut it down by just plugging it out. Um, yeah, okay. So. Uh, also, you m might be, and I'm not an expert, I'm not an attorney or something, but you might be liable for anything that that thing that just got hacked does, so be aware of that. Okay, if you still want to do it, let's briefly go over the um, core components of a mail server, or at least the core components of a mail server that are um, important now, because yes, every of these components that are here have way more detail to them. Uh, if you look at Postfix, that thing is uh, uh, not one thing, but it's like 20 different things that all operate together. I will not go into that detail because uh, for now it's not really important and I don't know it. <laughs> um, no, I will just give you the, the most important things right now. So, um, I mean, if we think of what happens when, there is, uh, when uh, a mail arrives at our server, obviously it has to find that server. And for that, we have to um, set, uh, set up a, a DNS entry, um, we have to uh, give it the name of our server, and we have to uh, put an MX entry uh, in there. Or, you, strictly speaking, you don't have to put an MX entry in trail, but it's really nice to do that. Um, I will go into that detail a bit later. Um, but when the mail then arrives at your server, we of course need some component uh, that will take take over the email and uh, read it and decide what to do with it. And uh, this component is uh, Postfix, or uh, the mail, uh, mail delivery agent, as m you will r uh, read in the uh, specific literature. And also, yes, I know this is strictly speaking not correct, but let's leave it at that. Um, the mail delivery agent will take over the email and decide, okay, what will I do with it? Um, most likely, it will, uh, it will first hand it over to a spam checking process, like um, in our case, our spam D, and uh, then um, uh, decide, okay, uh, is there a user for that on my server that I have to um, deliver that mail to? And uh, for that, it will basically, uh, or in our case, it will ask the um, mail storage, uh, Dovecot, um, hey, uh, can I, uh, can I store this mail with you? And Dovecot will either say no, or, and then it will, uh, uh, the mail delivery agent will reject the mail, um, or uh, it will say yes, and then here it is. Um, the uh, mail storage, um, in our co uh, case, a, soft, uh, a, a binary called Dovecot, um, will store the email and hand it out to you via IMAP. So you can access it with a Thunderbird or Apple Mail or whatever you use. And uh, it will know that you as a user exist because it will read the information from somewhere. And in our case, we will use an LDAP server. Um, this might be a kind of a controversial decision because LDAP servers are one of the um, worst design pieces of software that you can find. Um, the protocol to use them is so old and so weird, um, but you can think of them as, um, yeah, a big dictionary. That's always how I like to think of it. It's a big dictionary, and in the dictionary there are entries, and, we, and if you find something in there, there, there is information. So that's how I like to, um, I like to think about it. But it's not a dictionary. <laughs> but it helps. Okay. 
So um, the two other things that we uh, will encounter over and over again in this talk are uh, the uh, Docker deployment, because I um, Dockerized all these components. Um, that just helps me getting uh, away from the um, operating system versions, um, because normally, of course, uh, you can install these uh, uh, things on your operating system, uh, but then you're bound to, uh, or yeah, you're kind of bound to the versions that the operating system has or that the, the distribution has. Yes, you can install other versions, but it's a pain. Um, and I don't. I, I uh, wanted to use the uh, Dockerized versions. Also, if something goes wrong and I screw it up, uh, I just can delete the container and uh, get a new container. And and I didn't um, mess with the uh, mess the with the host OS. Um, so therefore, I did write some Docker images um, specifically for Apache DS stuff called Postfix RSpin DN Zogo. This is actually not hard to do. And uh, you will find all of these images on Docker Hub and on my uh, blog. And um, most importantly, you will not only find the images, but also the code on uh, for how to build images. Because there are a lot of images for these, um, uh, these binaries on uh, GitHub, uh, Docker Hub, sorry but you will not want to use them because they don't deliver the code, they are not official images, and you don't know what's in there. I mean, could be anything. Could be could be a duff cut, or could be um, something that uh, just hands your email out to uh, some Russian server. Don't know. So um, be careful what you do. Again, uh, operating a mail server is dangerous, and um, be sure that your images actually are this kind of software that you want to use. Um, of course, for some things there are official images, and I uh, also do use them because I kind of trust them. But yeah. Um, all right then, um, what we all um, will do uh, all the time uh, during this talk is for the images because I, I will briefly go over the images. But the images are um, always the same thing. You, what you do to build them. Um, is you um, take a, a base image, you install your dependencies on it, you copy a few uh, configuration files on it, and then you tell it how to run. That's everything. That's how every of these images is built. They are a bit different every time, but not much. And the most important thing that you always have to do is you have to put some kind of configuration in there to redirect the um, logging output to standard out so you can read it in the docker logs. Um, or at least that's that's how I do it. And uh, I will not write all the um, instructions, of course, myself now, because <laughs> that would take forever. Um, no, I use Ansible, which is a configuration management tool, which is a bit more declarative in its usage. So you um, don't say um, Docker runs for stuff, for instance, uh, but you um, hand over a file to Ansible and say, uh, look, Ansible, this is how I want it to be. And then Ansible goes and does the necessary steps to make it that way. And uh, the lower the um, uh, box uh, is one example of a simple script that, uh, for instance, uh, uh, pulls up the Apache uh, LDAP server. Um, it's a lot uh, at, at first, but actually what it uh, does is it says only, hey, um, take my image, um, hand out the port 389, and uh, save the, uh, the stuff that you, the, that you save um, somewhere where I can access it. By the way, um, to answer the question beforehand, I don't like Docker volumes, and I don't think it's necessary for a single server. Um, it's way easier for me, me maybe only, to back up that stuff if it's uh, bind mounted to somewhere of the host operating system, especially for DoveCut. And I will get into that later. And uh, all the Ansible roles, by the way, uh, Ah, um, yeah, that I, I should mention that too. Um, you could now write all these um, declarative instructions to one file, but it would be a lot uh, uh, very convoluted. So there is a way to partition them into um, reusable um, 
uh, chunks. And these chunks are then called roles. And here is a, a file structure of an example role. It's uh, the matching um, Apache DS uh, role. And it just says uh, here, look, I have my, my LDAP role. And in this are no files that I have to upload. Well, obviously, I'm not. Uh, um, mapping any files or copying any files here. But um, this is my task and this, this is this file. And then there are also some variables, but this file, uh, the file of the variable is really un uninteresting because it only contains this variable. And then I use a uh, so-called playbook and another file to just reference that role and say, okay, on my server, please do that. Okay, um, I will do this on the aforementioned Azure VM. I hope it's still online because um, a few hours ago it wasn't and uh, Azure portal was also down. Um, I hope it's now up and I can show it to you. Um, I uh, pre-installed something that's, uh, 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 that's not relevant to the mail server. I pre-installed Docker. Uh, that's not really interesting for the mail server itself. I, uh, I uh, put up a Docker bridge and uh, some basic tools like Vim and HTOP and stuff like that. And um, the base image is an Ubuntu 22.04, um, which also doesn't really matter. You can uh, use Docker on any uh, Linux or any modern Linux. And um, again, I uh, will run this mail server on my fun domain, which is molybdan for mandy. And um, I saw I uh, pointed that address to this uh, Docker VM, uh, to this Azure VM, and also I pointed the SMTP um, DNS entry to the Azure VM. And in the uh, I, I uh, created a, a record for the MX entry. And um, as we mentioned before, the MX entry is where any other server on the internet who wants to send mail to you will look first on. Uh, when he asks, hey, where should I send this mail to? Then it will look in this MX entry, and this MX entry um, goes to smtp.molybdanforman.de. Um, all right, that's everything for the um, introduction. Now let's uh, get started with the code. Um, first thing I will do is actually something that I uh, only have to have to use at the end, but I will do it now because it's super convenient to um, have the um, certificate already now. And then we will, all right, we will start with the first thing that we will set up and that's the um, LDAP server. That's actually the uh, task that we have seen before. Uh, that's, the, that's our user directory. Now you don't have to use an LDAP server, you can um, a user mail server with the, for instance, the accounts on the virtual machine itself. But that doesn't scale really well and it's also not really um, good for um, maintaining stuff. So uh, I, I decided to use an LDAP server and um, then there are three basically main LDAP servers that you can use. That's um, uh, Open LDAP, uh, 389 Directory Server and Apache DS. Of course, there is Active Directory, but that again is a Microsoft product, and I'm I'm already happy if that virtual machine works. So, seriously, um, yeah. So um, Apache DS has the advantage of um, bringing a nice GUI with it, so an Eclipse-based uh, GUI that helps you manage it. And I will use now this GUI to. Um, oh. Yeah, that doesn't look like the uh, internet connection is really back. Name resolution error. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, in this case, I will scrap it for now, um, unfortunately. Uh, that's, I'm, I'm very sorry about that, uh, but uh, without network, there is no live demo. I will just talk about what I want to do or what I would do. And uh, um, basically, I would uh, now go and pre uh, execute my um, prepared scripts. Um, normally, you would not do that. <laughs> uh, you would uh, just use something like this, where you just put all your roles into one list and then execute that. Um, but 
because I wanted to do it step by step, I um, uh, tr I put every role into one file, so it's it's always the same, but with like uh, only one role, or the elder has only one role. And ah, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, better, even even better like this. Okay. Everybody cool with that? Okay. Um, all right. So the first task would be then to uh, bring up the LDAP server. Now I have to look for it. <laughs> Where is it? LDAP here. Okay. So again, that's the file that we have uh, seen before, and it uh, just um, uh, just brings up the LDAP server. And uh, the next thing that we would do is we go to the um, uh, to the configuration tool. Yeah, I can all only show that on an Apache LDAP, um, LDAP server. Okay, what we then would do is um, create a new partition in that. And that's a bit tricky to find. Actually, uh, it's not hard to do, but it's uh, tricky to find. Um, because I want uh, in that in that di dictionary um, tree, I would say, because um, if you follow the, the keys, then you get like a tree structure. And I want a new branch. And to create that new root branch, you have to go into the configuration. Um, you have to uh, uh, right-click here and go Open Configuration. And uh, when you... What? Is it back? That can't be. The LDAP server is not running. Yeah, whatever. No, it's not back. Okay, then you right-click on the configuration, and uh, then you add your new tree. And uh, that's um, that's very convenient for you to save all your stuff in that tree and not use another tree that's maybe used by the internal structure or something like that. Um, now, LDAP uh, in itself is um, yeah tricky uh, a bit because uh, you have to design that tree somehow, and it's really corporate focused. So it it will give you. Uh, and and the leaves of the tree they have to have specific uh, classes which only allow specific attributes. That's quite nasty. But um, most of the time I cr just create an organization that has my family name, and then I create an organizational unit that has a user's uh, name, and then I create all the users underneath that. If you want to um, look for uh, how to create a user, I use uh, init org person. Um, which has most of the stuff that I need, uh, mostly the common name and the user password. Okay, uh, once we uh, did set that up, we um, continue to the next piece of software, and in my case, that's the uh, mail storage. Uh, for mail storage, um, again, we will use an IMAP server that can then can be accessed um, through uh, uh, IMAP uh, with your normal um, Thunderbird or Apple Mail or whatever. And um, again, the script is the same as before, um, or as mentioned, uh, it just copies the configuration files there and then starts the container. Um, maybe one thing that should be noted, yes, it of course uses uh, again the, the uh, container by me, and it also hands in um, the certificates that the program that I started before will give you, and uh, it mounts the uh, configuration for the mail um, to the host system. Um, I find that convenient because it then can access the mail files directly and can backup them directly. Um, but honestly, everybody does backups differently. And uh, that's... Your so should I sum that up or uh, so it's 20 minutes left Thir okay <laughs> okay um, because he just uh, held up all this uh, the papers that he had and it says 5 10 and 15 and I could choose okay <laughs> but it's, thank you very much um, yeah okay um, for smaller installations, uh, you will not have really performance issues with your mail server. Uh, so I think it's really handy to have all the mails in one file. Uh, not, sorry, not all the mails in one file. Every mail in one file that you can copy and paste and recover from if something goes wrong, because something will go wrong. And 
yes, there's pure text files, but um, in um, yeah, it's it's pure text files. Uh, or uh, actually, you can put this um, mail ending on them, and then it will be readable via, uh, with Thunderbird. Uh, I think yeah, but I never did that. Yeah. So uh, there are other ways of storing it with DoveCut. There are more high-performance options, um, but um, again, unless you have uh, dozens or hundreds of users, you will or or really loads of emails, you will not uh, get into the the pro uh, you not run, will not run into the problem uh, that you have performance issues. Um, okay. So we have, of course, uh, to hand over the configuration file for Dovecot, and uh, this is um, only interesting in two or three places. Um, we tell Dovecot, okay, we want IMAP, because that's why we install Dovecot. And um, more uh, also important, we have to tell Dovecot we do not only want IMAP, we also want this protocol called LMTP which is more um, a local protocol for shipping mails around, and that will later be used by our MDA, the, the postfix, to hand the mail over to Dovecot. Uh, we will accept um, two uh, ways of uh, login, plain and uh, login. Plain sounds dangerous, but uh, we will, of course, use SSL uh, and SSL only. Um, for determining if a user can log in, if a user has a mailbox on the server, we tell um, a Dovecot uh, to look into the LDAP directory. Um, that's a separate uh, configuration file, which I will open soon. And uh, the rest is fairly standard. Um, this uh, file you will only need if you, have, uh, if you serve multiple domains. Um, so don't be, uh, don't be led astray. Um, Again, we have to uh, log to the cons console to um, be able to read the mails um, and uh, to read the log files on, on Docker. And uh, now we come to the meat of the configuration file, which is um, these two lines. And they work in uh, conjunction. And um, maybe first uh, the lower line, it says, um, please save my mails to the folder, uh, to the user folder and subfolder mailder, and do it in the format mailder, this string in the front, this is really important because you can put other things there and it will use a completely different format. And uh, don't, by, by the way, don't ever change it after the fact. There are tools to convert mailboxes into other mailboxes, but you can't just change that after you once used it first and saved mail there. Um, but you might have uh, noticed that there is a problem. The users don't have um, user uh, directories there on the server because all our users only exist in LDAP and not on the server itself. This is why we tell the um, uh, Dovecot, okay, uh, the user um, directories uh, or the, uh, the home directories of the users are here in var, spool, mail, vhosts. Then the domain that we use in the email uh, in this case, molybdenformand.de, and then uh, the username. And this will be their home directory. This is also where they um, the, they might drop other things, uh, like sieve scripts or so for filtering. Um, this will go there. Um, again, REST is fairly simple. Of course, we will um, only uh, accept SSL connections um, with the certificates that we handed in before. Um, yeah, fairly standard. And uh, this this stuff is for um, if you then read the configuration files yourself later. This stuff is just for um, telling Dovecot that some folders are special, like your drafts folder or your junk folder or your trash folder. Um, it makes it easier also for the uh, Thunderbird or so to find that folder. Okay, once that is started, uh, we have something to put our mails into. But um, we need something to um, uh, to uh, accept our mail or send our mail, and this uh, th this piece of software um, is called the uh, it's the actual mail server, the mail transfer agent, mail um, mail delivery agent, whatever you. This is all in there, and. Um, this will accept mails from the internet, put it into Dovecot, or accept your mails and hand it out. Um, 
But our configuration in uh, Ansible is uh, fairly standard. Um, you just take again all the configuration files, put it on the server, and then um, tell Ansible, OK, pl now please start a container. Uh, the interesting part, of course, is uh, what's uh, in the configuration files. And there are many of them. Because um, apparently, and rather annoyingly, um, handing mails around is super hard. Um, there are so many things that go on and so many rules. Um, so I, I, I will try to simplify it a bit. Um, uh, f first of all, what you should do, um, you should mm, kind of disregard the master configuration. <laughs> because there's so much stuff in there that you actually don't need. You only need one thing and um, uh, for your setup, uh, and that's most of the time this, this line here, this uh, submission line. And that uh, you should un, un, um, comment that, and that basically tells um, uh, Postfix, OK, we open another port. And on that special port, the 587, we will later uh, accept mails from our users. Not from the internet, from our own users. And um, that's it for that file. In, in most distributions, just leave that file alone. Um, most of the time, you don't have to screw with it. Much more important is the main configuration. And in this configuration, um, we have to um, first uh, make one important distinction. The mail server can either serve mail for like itself, like for um, the um, smtp.modulinformain.de domain, which is its own host name, but it also can serve mails for completely different domains. Um, you can put into whatever the google.com domain as an X server, you can put smtp.modulinformain.de. That's completely legal. You can do that. And uh, many people most of the time use that. Um, so you um, have to uh, tell Postfix somehow that you are hosting mail for a completely virtual domain. Not your own domain, but a virtual domain. Still, your domain in this case is monobdanformand.de, and your host name is SNTP. Your domain, and this is just filled here from there. Um, but um, the, the what uh, we will only um, we will not really accept mails for that. Because we say, okay, now my, my, my destination only, I, I will only treat localhost like that. For everything else, I will use the um, virtual mailbox settings. So, m me, myself, I, I, I don't really accept mail, but I accept mail for all these virtual domains that I host. And you have to use these three settings for that. Is all, um, first of all, it's a virtual domain uh, mailbox domains. This is a list. You can uh, go and uh, add domains for that. Um, of course, in these domains, there has to be an MX entry that points to the server. And uh, when we then receive a domain for that, we will use the virtual transport setting to hand this over to Dovecot. Um, then you will uh, have in your mail server um, files that uh, have aliases in them that, uh, for instance, say, okay, um, your user Peter is also available under um, schlafkätzchen at um, And you can put that in there. And for the virtual um, uh, domains that you use, these are special virtual files, and they go into this one. All right. I see a lot of uh, stunned faces. Are there any questions right now? Too many? Yes, please. Um, so, do we, uh, if you want to have like a catch all email, is this yes. like the RDS or well, um, Yeah, you can do it via the aliases. Yes, that's possible, but you can do it actually multiple ways. Um, none. You shouldn't have a catch-all email, because it will catch all email. And people will try to send email to whatever na username at your server. If you look at the log files later at your server, it's just uh, uh, this username, that username, that username. They will constantly probe your servers for usernames. Um, you should have um, two very important um, addresses. Uh, or 
three. This is the Postmaster, Abuse, and Webmaster. These are um, uh, recommended by the RFC, and uh, actually, even spammers don't use that. So, um, I, I, on the mail servers that I administrate, I have never received spam on these three email addresses. But you, um, I, I always keep them available, and I don't even spam filter them, because if someone wants to um, report an abuse on my email, uh, I have to be able to react. Of course, for my personal email server, I will just decline the request because I sent the email. <laughs> but maybe um, my, um, I, I misconfigured something and my server is handing out spam, then uh, someone could use the abuse at uh, email address um, to uh, send a, a request for me to delete that. Yeah, you should absolutely have these three ex uh, exceptions in your files. Um, yeah, other questions? Up to now? Okay. Um, yes? Um, so let's say uh, your server is like down and not working. Yeah. Where does the mail come from from the outside? Does it just like disappear into the void? No. Um, good question. Um, so the, the mail from outside will not be sent to you in this case. The, when, when a mail server um, takes a mail from you, it's basically like a mail carrier. He now has the uh, responsibility to carry that mail to its destination. And he will try its, uh, or uh, a proper mail server which will, will try its best to do that. So if he can't reach the destination, he will try again uh, with a back off like five minutes, 15 minutes or whatever, most likely 15 minutes. Uh, and uh, then he will try again and again and again and again until some limit is reached. But um, most mail servers will um, uh, use very high limits and tr uh, try to deliver that mail really thoroughly. All right. Okay. Um, again, if you have questions, just ask them. Um, okay. Now, when we go to uh, use our Thunderbird to uh, send mail through that mail server, that uh, mail server also has to know that, uh, whether it will accept this mail from us or not. And here we use a um, shortcut because, of course, you could now configure um, the, the uh, postfix also to uh, go to the LDAP server and ask for whether this user exists or not. But that's actually quite a hassle because the format for that is still different than from Dovecut. And um, what I do instead um, is use a nice feature of Dovecut and Dovecut allows um, to uh, distribute that information to the mail server. So it will um, uh, um, make a SASL um, port available, a uh, socket available, where the postfix can then ask Dovecot, hey, does that user exist? And that's what we do here. So, um, of course, we will also only um, allow uh, SSL authentication because otherwise we would send our uh, passwords through plain text uh, over, the, over the internet. It's not recommended. Um, and we will uh, use um, uh, the uh, high setting for the TLS ciphers. You can screw around with the setting a lot. <laughs> uh, people like to do that. Um, I read somewhere that high is a good setting, but you can specify every single cipher there if you want to. Um, so, uh, no anonymous mail and use, TL uh, use TLS and uh, we will ask uh, Dovecot for whether that account actually exists. Um, of course, we have to also hand it over the um, certificates. And uh, then, basically, now our mail server would be running. And mm, not maybe the first mail, but certainly the second and third and 100th mail would be spam that it receives. So now we have to do something about spam. And there, uh, this is a really big problem, obviously, you all know, um, but um, it's not an easy problem because the spam, sometimes, sometimes it's dumb, sometimes it's really sophisticated. And um, 
so we have to take a multi-layered approach to actually uh, try to filter it. We will not be able to filter it completely, obviously, but um, we, we will do our best. And the first line of defense against spam is actually, again, Postfix or the, the mail server itself. When it receives mail, um, it, of course, can it has to read the mail and in that instance it's al it already can uh, try to block stuff. For instance, it can block um, non-full qualified senders. If, if the sender just says, hey, I'm Joe, then my mail server says, okay, go away. Um, if, oops, um, if the uh, recipient is um, uh, not full qualified and if you say hey I want to send a message to Peter and then my mail server goes okay Peter who do you know that guy um, no it's just Peter nah Peter's not good enough and uh, stuff like that it can reject if uh, obviously that that's an important thing if if you don't know the sender domain if you're not responsible for accepting mail for that uh, domain don't accept that mail if you don't know the recipient domain, also don't accept that mail and stuff like that. We, we are, but of course we also have to um, accept some mail and uh, the mail that we accept first is that come, uh, that, yes? I, I, I come again? The unknown sender, the, this one? Um, yeah, if it, if the, um, if you send a um, mail to the uh, to someone, you have to um, specify the domain. For instance, like gmail.com. And if it's like uh, xepsilonzy.com, and the mail server can't determine what that domain is, if it can't resolve that domain, then it will not accept that domain. Uh, that mail, sorry. But it will, um, uh, by, by the way, these uh, um, conditions are uh, evaluated in order. And that's why permit my networks is uh, up top. Now, this is actually a controversial setting because this will permit everyone from this list to just send mail without any checks. The, obviously, that's bit problematic but it always worked for me and uh, if you if you don't put something on the internet in there um, but maybe just your local net then yeah okay someone can hack something on your local network and then send unlimited mail yeah okay I maybe I, I accept that risk um, also I accept the Sassel authenticated people and these are the ones who will uh, these are my users who uh, will um, uh, authenticate via the uh, submission port that we mentioned before and um, I will just accept mails from them maybe that's not wise uh, depending on the kind of users that you have but for this server it's most likely only me so yeah um, okay uh, obviously also reject people that you don't know and otherwise permit the stuff. And then our second line of defense. Or are there any, any more questions to that filter? By the way, there are, um, there are other way, uh, there are other settings. So for instance, you can uh, do Halo uh, recipient restrictions that actually would come before but they don't make uh, a lot of sense because uh, in the implementation of Postfix, it's like he will uh, read a chunk of email first, and when he has read that, you can also already do all of these checks. So you could theoretically do checks before that, but in practice, you won't. So I, I'll, I'll just put that in here. Yes? One thing, um, one thing like my little attempts at doing the mail thing um, were always really hard is not getting filtered as spam by other people. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to set up like the DMARC records in your DNS um, yeah. and whatever. Um, will, will you get to that or? Um, um, 
Hardly, <laughs> because um, um, when I designed this talk, I just wanted to get it running. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, yeah, I can uh, uh, I can say something for that. So this is, and what he ma mentions is the other side of the equation. Of course, we don't want to accept spam, but the other people don't want to accept spam either. So they will also be very thorough on checking who you are. And um, they will do, of course, the same stuff that we do. But they might do other things as well. And basically, um, uh, running a mail server is building up a kind of credibility. Um, if, if you have this credibility, then people will accept mails from you. Or if you just are Gmail, then you have to accept mails from Gmail because most people use Gmail. Yeah? Okay, then you can't do anything, uh, even if the, they send spam to you. Um, of course, you can decline it, but then you will uh, block out like 30% of the internet but that's not really productive. Um, but uh, you as a small mail server, uh, server operator, you have to jump through their hoops and uh, then build up a like, credibility. And they will, uh, depending on who it is, they will um, use other things to determine your credibility, like this SPF record, which is um, a, an, another record in your DNS entry that um, uh, can, where we, uh, can determine um, from whom from this domain should mails be accepted. And you can uh, use another technique that's DMARC, where you um, uh, publish a hash of a uh, public key uh, in, in your DNS entry again, and uh, every email from that mail server now has to be signed with that public key. And when the public key matches to the, what you have um, uh, published in, uh, in, in DNS, then that will build trust and but actually most of the spammers now use DMARC too so it's not really good um, they they five minutes all oh, right okay are you sure <laughs> okay uh, we have to speed up a bit okay um, yeah so they will uh, they will use other factors like um, some some will even require you to have a web page um, that they actually check then if there is a web page running on this domain and uh, if not then then you will drop out of their favor and um, especially Microsoft is uh, is really really dickish with accepting mail they will um, block your mail for like no reason and they will not tell you why and they will uh, very hardly um, um, put you back uh, uh, in, into the whitelist. They will, they will just do that at random and you can do basically nothing about it. And then they will have this great, oh, I want to unlock my domain page and that won't work any, uh, because it's a Microsoft page. Yeah, uh, uh, that's actually how it works. Um, okay, our second line of defense, <clears throat> just to mention that, and then we will skip the web, inter uh, the web interface because it's, uh, it, it, we won't be able to show it anyway. Um, the second line of defense is RSpamD. RSpamD uh, is actually um, a fairly modern spam checking um, possibility. Uh, before that, there was Spam Assassin, uh, but that was really hard to configure. Um, RSpamD, <clears throat> if you just want to use it, it's really easy to configure. You just use the standard configuration files and you do stuff like uh, tell it where, the, uh, where your antivirus uh, container is, which is just like this line. And then, um, of course, you put the logging again on the console and you tell it where Redis is. So really, really basic stuff. The only thing where you have to think for a moment is um, if you want to just use one process for RSPMD, um, then you um, have to put this line in that the base, because RSPMD can be scaled to very high loads, but you don't, won't have that loads, hopefully. And um, then you can use just one process and then you disable the normal worker and uh, use the proxy worker to just scan a mail. So that's, that's the most important line here. And of course, the socket where you put it in, but that's the standard socket. I just copied everything else. Um, okay, and then Postfix will send the uh, emails to RSpamD and that will check it for viruses and check it for spam. And if it uh, is um, confident enough that it, this is spam, then it will actually reject the email. You don't. You can configure that, and um, I like to immediately reject the mail to to keep the po uh, connection from the client that wants to send me the mail open, um, because uh, some. Uh, uh, 
a uh, email guru Peter Heinlein once said in one of his talks that is uh, it is um, advantageous for legal reasons to immediately reject email because then it's like you haven't accepted it no way of knowing that if that's true but he said it and uh, he makes his money by administering mail servers by the way there's a really good book on postfix and dovecot from him so i'm not affiliated or anything he doesn't even know i exist but uh, these books are really good um okay then we will uh skip the uh um zogo part because that that would be um showing it and i can't show it obviously and uh, go directly to the questions. Yes, please. How resource in intensive would you say is uh, running a mail server? Let's not, say on a not. tiny computer, even the Raspberry? Um, yeah, can do that. If you only use a basic Postfix and Dovecot, uh, it, it can run on very, very little. Um, the resource intensive, intensive things are more like uh, spam filtering, RSpamD, ClamAV, obviously, the um, virus checker. But uh, the, the Postfix and Dovecot are super optimized. Other questions? Is Sogo a, a webmail interface? Yeah, now Sogo is uh, actually a groupware. There are many groupwares out, uh, out there, but I like Sogo. Uh, it brings um, uh, Cardaf and Caldaf um, sync possibility. It has um, contacts uh, calendar built in. It has a uh, material design interface. Um, it's, uh, it has not all the perks of, l uh, let's say, um, uh, uh, here, What's the file sharing thing called? Uh, come again? Nextcloud. Nextcloud, yeah, Nextcloud. But actually, ne I hate Nextcloud for its um, mail client. That thing just doesn't work. And Zogo is built for mail, and I use that. It's just a personal choice. You can do whatever you want. Because when the rest runs, yeah, plugging in Zogo is just pointing into the mail server. Like your Thunderbird client. It basically does the same thing. Yes? running my own mail server since about 10 years. Um, I can confirm the most uh, difficult part is to get other people accept your mail. Like uh, Telecom, T-Online has a, a dedicated um, email address you can write to. That's a huge advantage. As you, t as you told, there's no way to contact Microsoft. Yeah. And Microsoft you don't just know on you. which... Uh, spam list you're listed on by the previous owner of the IP address. I mean, I don't want to suggest that Microsoft makes a business of, uh, out of it to um, reject your mail because then you need a Microsoft account, but it's something you should probably think about. Yeah. Um, I will show, uh, I have to say that there's a great tool like uh, called Mail Checker there you can in send an email to them and it uh, checks if you other yeah. people will accept it um, just to uh, make the, it yes. easier for other people here. There is also the, own server. the M MX toolbox or something uh, like yeah, that it's that called, where, the, where there are, um, uh, is a collection of tools that you can use also to verify uh, SSL, verify spam checking, uh, stuff like that. Uh, I think he was first. <laughs> ah, sorry. <laughs> um, I've been running my own mail server for about two years, and um, I'm using a really amazing project called um, Simple NixOS Mail Server. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, have you heard That's of it? That's great. Yeah, I've heard of it. Haven't used it. By the way, um, my my solution runs on Docker and on my Docker images because I like to use them and I like to fiddle with it. If you want that solution in a bit more refined and a bit, a bit more maintained, there is a mail cow, which basically does the same but in better. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't want to diss myself, but this is uh, also for me it's fun. I know I'm weird, but uh, yeah, if you don't want to invest so much time, just use mail cow. And uh, another solution is mail you. That's even yeah. runnable on containers, on uh, Kubernetes. Ah, okay. Yeah, okay. I don't have a Kubernetes server, unfortunately. <laughs> All right. Now I get kicked out.
Thank you anyway. <laughs>